Hello, I'm retired Battalion Chief Larry Cockman from the Greensboro, North Carolina Fire Department History Book Committee. We're here today at the Greensboro Historical Museum. I'm standing in front of the General Green, the first steam pumper, or as they called it back then, a steamer. Today, December 9th, 2019, we are starting a new tradition of recording and preserving the heritage and culture of our retirees. Our retirees have contributed so much to the success of our great fire department. Their stories retire with them and are sometimes gone forever when they pass away. They will share their emergency calls that will always be a part of their memories forever. So sit back and listen as they carry us through their journey in the Greensboro Fire Department. Ronald Osborne, uh, 77 years old. <clears throat> when I retired, I was a uh, captain I'm from Pleasant Garden. Uh, my family has lived on the property that I live on since 1753. So as far as I know, uh, none of my family were ever firefighters. I was driving a uh, fuel oil delivery, home delivery truck, <clears throat> uh, locally in Greensboro. And uh, I, in, in life, I was 19 years old, married with one child, had just moved into a new house, and uh, get my life started, I guess. Uh, we had uh, three or four uh, part-time workers at the oil company where I did. It helped us in the cold weather. It was Graham Fuquay and uh, Sam Goins and the Red Wren, and they all uh, occasionally rode with me, and they kept telling me I need to be a firefighter. And I'd never been in a fire station. So uh, they said, they're hiring, go up and talk to them. So I went up and, and uh, actually the day that I went, I went to Duke Power, I went to Bell Telephone, and I went to the fire department. And I was offered a job at all three places. And I chose the fire department because I knew somebody there. I knew the guys that I had been working with there. Well, I met with Chief Wouche and interviewed. And he said, you need to get a physical and do this. And, I did all of that and fingerprinted and so forth and uh, was hired. I never considered it until I started working with these guys that were firefighters. <clears throat> never been in a fire station. I mean, 16, there were 16 in my training class as far as I remember. There could have been 17, could have been 15, but I think there was 16. From, for a farm boy, the training was very simple other than some of the book work, some of the math and stuff. Uh, you know, that, I never was, you know, I'm really good at math, but I never did understand algebra, but I had to learn to understand it whenever I started doing reach of ladders and pump pressures and stuff. Yeah, during, during the uh, training class, I remember one thing that, uh, that has stuck in my mind for years. Uh, Chief Powell was a training officer, and we were in the t at the tower, and we're going to uh, repel at the windows. And he uh, told Jim Parker to go up on the, take the, uh, lifeline and go up on the roof and secure it for us to slide the rope. Well, we waited and we waited and we waited and no rope ever came down. So he turned around and looked at me and said, Osborne, go up and check on Parker. So I went up and Parker was up about the fourth floor of the fire escape shaking. He said, I can't go any higher, any higher, I'm scared. And I said, well, you just stand here and hand me the rope. So I went up and tied it off. And I never did tell anybody okay. this during the time because I didn't want to get Parker in any trouble. But he, he made it through training, and I mean, he overcame his, his fright of that, but, uh, but I'll never forget it. I, you know, it's just one of those funny things that, that happens. Uh, Jerry Brasson was in the class, uh, Philip Hockett, uh, Wayne Kofer, uh, Gary Falk. In fact, Gary and I went to be fingerprinted. I met him at the police department, and I had gone to school with him, so I... No, I, you know, it, where I was in life with uh, family and all, I just needed a secure job. And that's the reason that I applied at the places I did because I didn't feel like that I wanted to spend my life driving an oil truck. And uh, I wanted something that was secure that, <clears throat> that my family could depend on.
We married 59 years, we 60 years in September, <clears throat> and I have three children, eight grandchildren, and they're all very grand. The first station assignment was Central Fire Station on Engine 2. Well, I had never worked in that type of environment at all, and you know, my first day on the fire park was in training, so uh, it was, you know, uh, sleeping in a dormitory with other guys and all this stuff was new to me. I mean, you know, I was never in the service, so it was uh, it was new to me. But uh, I adapted to whatever, and uh, like I say, I need a job, and that, this was this was it. <laughs> D.C. Burns was my first captain. There were several of the people I went through training were there. Uh, Philip Pocket was there. Uh, Jerry Branson was there, Wayne Kofu was there, and uh, of course there was Jay Lewis, and I, the one that was in my training class, I forgot, was uh, Spooky Phillips, Clarence Phillips, and he was quite a character. Yeah, I, was, I was called the Oz. No, Jerry Branson, I think the one that came up with it, <laughs> and uh, he said, here comes the Oz. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we all slept in the uh, upper floor of the central fire station, and uh, I won't call any names, but one of the firefighters was scared to death of spiders, so I took a fishing, real fine fishing line, and hooked it to one of the lights above his bed, and put a spider, a rubber spider on it, and would let it down on his face, <laughs> and he'd smack that thing, and I'd pull it back up. <laughs> and everybody in the, in the uh, dormitory was, Awake by that time, <laughs> wonder what he was hollering and trying to trying to kill that rubber spider. <laughs> yeah, well, growing up on a farm, almost all farm kids uh, learned to cook because uh, all of our meals were homemade, and I still make homemade biscuits and stuff like that. Uh, each uh, company uh, cooked for a week, so you know, ever there were four companies in Central Fire Station, so once a month you had one week a month cook and uh, the captain would uh, tell you tomorrow's your day to cook and and uh, and he would and, and he would help with it and uh, yeah I, yeah absolutely you know there's a lot of discussions and stuff going on and uh, and a lot of fun things happen while we're eating I mean uh, uh, one of them night that I recall very much so and and, uh, and I'll and uh, Raymond Reddick who died this past week uh, was at one end of the table, the long table, and he said, well, somebody passed the butter, and nobody paid any attention. Well, somebody passed the butter about three times, and finally he turned his head and a stick of butter hit him beside the face. <laughs> and I never will forget that. And I, you know, I thought about that the other day. I said, you know the stuff that we did to that poor guy, and, and he took it all in stride. He was, he was such, a, such a great guy. Well, the don he, it, was a, it was a broomstick with dynamite paper wrapped around it, and a fuse, and a, a flammable fuse. And he came to the door with tears right down his cheek, and he said, I've just had all I can stand, I can't take any more. He said, I'm just gonna get rid of all of y'all. And, uh, and he lit a, lit a match to that. And uh, I was one of the ones that pushed the air conditioner out of the window and went out the window. <laughs> we had to buy an air conditioner because of it. <laughs> well, at, uh, at Central Fire Station, there was an A and P uh, down a block and a half from there. And we would walk down to the A&P and get the groceries. And uh, sometimes if it was a lot, we would bring a shopping cart back and then take it back when we went back the next day or somebody would. But usually we, wrote, we kept a shopping cart from the A&P at the fire station to take back as and far as. And uh, uh, there were a lot of pinto beans eaten and, and uh, a lot of spam and uh, <laughs> slaw and that kind of stuff. We chipped in a dollar a day. And if we had something special, like uh, maybe once a month we may have steak and we might have to throw in two dollars. But <laughs> a typical uh, afternoon, Sunday afternoon at uh, Central Station back in those days, we had two or three auxiliary firefighters that would come, uh, and on Sundays particularly. And I think some of them want to get away from their wives and stuff, but I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember Roy Jones and uh, Bob Wilson and some of those guys, and they were they were 
they always wanted to ride on the truck I was on. They would jump on if we got a call. And, uh, and we had a good time together. My family usually came for uh, supper on, uh, on Sunday afternoon. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of the kids who got to know each other fairly well uh, from meeting there. And some of the wives sometimes would, would uh, carpool together. Uh, ben Fields' wife uh, and my wife would, would ride together some and, and with all the kids in the car, take turns driving. But what a lot of people don't realize, we had to pay for parking. And it was like $30 a month out of your $312 for parking. And what we did, we, the, uh, we had two shifts back then, so uh, they were split up between, you know, would you move your car in the morning to the street so the other guy could get the parking place in one of the parking lots. And, uh, and you split up the cost, and it was usually $30 a month, so it cost each one of you 15 But uh, And all the other fire stations in the city of Greensboro had free parking. There was a drawback to working at Central Fire Station because, you know, when you're making $312 a month and you're taking $15 of it to pay for parking. Well, downtown, uh, parking on the street, you were allowed like two hours. And you're on, you on duty for 24 hours. So uh, you, could, you could go move your car every two hours if you could find another space to put it in and not pay. But what if you're on a fire call, then you're going to get a parking ticket. And back then, they were very strict. I mean, uh, in fact, the, 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 uh, the, we call them uh, parking maids. They had three or four police officers, and they would eat lunch with us a lot. The cooking, actually, there's a cookbook, and I, 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 I should have tried to find it. It uh, was, made, it was a nationwide thing, and I had a couple of recipes in it. And they sent it, they noticed to the fire department. Uh, they wanted to, some recipes for firefighters in different areas of the United States and, uh, and and two of the recipes that I sent in got published in the cookbook and I've got that cookbook somewhere but I don't know where it is. I'll try to find it. One of them was potatoes with cheese on top baked, mm -hmm. uh, thin sliced potatoes with cheese and crackers on top baked and uh, I'm trying to think what else I did in there was two, I had two recipes in the book and I can't, take, I can't remember what the other one. I hadn't thought about that in years. At Central Fire Station, uh, weather permitting, uh, the parking lot <clears throat> in the back, when everybody moved out of it, the old businesses, cars were gone, we put up a net and played volleyball. <clears throat> and uh, I never did play as much as, as most of the other guys did because I was always trying to rest <laughs> so I could make it the next day. <laughs> Because I was doing farm work and, and a lot of other things when I was, you know, when I became a farmer. I was 27 years old. The one before me was was R.L. Powell. He was 31. I was the youngest fire captain that had that the fire the Greensboro Fire Department had ever had at the time I made it. The school kids all came to Central Fire Station to and, and for a tour. Well, uh, I was in charge of the upstairs cleanup in the mornings. Each captain had a part of the building. One had a truck room. One had the uh, offices, and, but anyway, uh, I, the uh, captain that was up there before me never, uh, whenever they got through uh, shining the brass on Fridays, uh, they had to wash the rags so they'd be ready for the next week. They had a little Maytag uh, washing machine, ringer washing machine, in a utility sink at the back of the station there. Well, there was three or four school classes coming through, and I matched with the guys up there about washing rags and lost. I thought it was fixed, but I lost. So I was down washing the rags and all the guys were standing around laughing about it, you know. And one of the teachers said, uh, y'all laughing about the rookie washing the rags? And one of the guys said, no, he's the boss. <laughs> and, and they, but they thought I was a rookie <laughs> because, you know, I was one of the younger ones there. And I never will forget another thing about being a young captain. Uh, Plumer Leslie was driving me one time and uh, he had a little scratch the car and it turned and I told him to stop and he said I'm not stopping I didn't do any damage and I said you hit that car you, you know and I said stop and so he stopped and he said boy I was a firefighter before he was born I looked it up and he was <laughs> <laughs> so so being young sometimes has uh, deterred <laughs> for some somewhat yes uh, I don't think there's near as much of it. Of course, I haven't been involved in the fire department. 
I've never been, I had, in the last uh, 29 years, I probably hadn't been in three fire stations, other than I was on the board of directors at Pleasant Garden, but other than that, uh, when I left, I was gone. I mean, you know, uh, I did take a couple of grandchildren back to one of the fire stations, and I, I was in an accident, and I went and took a couple of uh, dozen donuts to the guys that answered the call. Uh, I was in a head-on collision in Greensboro, and, and uh, they answered the call and, and helped me out. Okay, it's, it's important when a retired firefighter visits a fire station that uh, the younger guys particularly, and all the firefighters there, uh, uh, be, uh, try to learn from them and, uh, and, 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 uh, and let them know about what, how things are done in the present and, uh, and the retired guy can let them know how it was done in the past. And, uh, and both, both, of you, both parties can learn from that. Some people it's just a job, others it's a, it is a passion of, uh, to me it was a passion. And I can tell you I've made a lot more money away from the fire department my whole career than I ever made at the fire department. And uh, it was a passion for me once I learned about helping people, and I've carried that on after my retirement, not in the fire service, but I've been on disaster things to, started it uh, in Florida when Andrew hit down there, I spent a month down there, and uh, all the way to Katrina, to, uh, I spent down at uh, New Orleans rebuilding, and uh, drove there, paid my own expenses, and, you know, and, and helped. But uh, I've been fortunate to be able to do that. And in fact, I had employees that went with me and I paid their salary while they were there to help. The first call that I remember going on that we had a working fire was on Church Street. And it was a, uh, some type of a garage with mechanics working in it. I don't remember the name of it. But uh, it was burning, and it was a show I don't know, oil or gas fire. And uh, I can't remember who it was, but one of the other rookies caught a hydrant, or was supposed to catch a hydrant, and for some reason he was trying to turn, turn it on the wrong way, and we didn't get water. So, so uh, I saw what was happening, and I said, we, can't get, we don't have any water, we don't have any water. So I ran back up and turned it the right way. <laughs> You try to turn it off, and you can't turn it. Once the hydrant's off, you can't keep turning it. <laughs> I ran. I did. I was. I rode the rescue about every day that I was there, at Central Fire Station and at Station Five, and uh, that most of it was wrecks and drownings. I went on like 29 drownings in my career, and uh, the one that I remember the most, there were twin brothers drowned out, and. Uh, out off of uh, window or uh, towards Barlington area. And uh, I mean, some of those are still, but uh, I know we found the one, I didn't know there were two, two of them had drowned. And uh, we uh, found, found the body of one, got it out. And I said, uh, went over to the grandfather who was there fishing with him and said, I'm sorry about all this. And he said, are you not gonna get his brother out? And I said, <laughs> I had no idea that there were two drownings. But one of them went in to, to, to free up a hook and didn't come up. And the other, the other brother went in to, to get him and both of them drowned. And stuff like that, you know, stays with you the rest of your life. Uh, doing rescue work, there's some things that uh, stand out. One that i never forget, uh, there was an accident at NC-62 and Randleman Road, right there two miles, two and a half miles from my house which I got through that, I went through that intersection this morning. But anyway, there was a Volkswagen had ran underneath a big uh, flatbed truck. Uh, and there was a child there that had a piece of glass stuck straight in his eye. And, uh, and I looked at it and I said, what in the world? Well, there was a convenience store right across 50 yards from there. And I told somebody, go get me a paper cup. And I put the cup over the eye and taped it. And uh, I got a notice from the doctor at the hospital wanted to know when I went back to the fire station the next day that I worked, wanted to know who did that. I thought I was going to be reprimanded. And he said, you saved that child's sight by doing that. And uh, stuff like that, you know, is just... During 9-11, uh, my first thing would be uh, whoever did this, 
give me their names and I'll take care of it. Because I, you know, I'm a, I'm a person that uh, believes in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You mess with me, you're gonna get messed with. <laughs> when I found out about, I was going to walk, walked into the barber shop that morning, and I had not heard anything about it. And, and it was the first plane that crashed into the building. And uh, one, of, one of my uh, cousins, who I don't know whether you ever met Chip Osborne or not, but he uh, still teaches fire science and somewhere down in Rockingham County or somewhere, I don't know where. But anyway, not Rockingham, down in the Troy area. But uh, he, uh, he was in the barber chair, and I said something about these firefighters going in. Uh, I said, that's, you know, that's their final thing is going in that building. He said, oh, and I said, uh, they know what they're doing. I said, those buildings are not built for that kind of truck. I said, it rattled that building. Every bolt in that building is loose. And I said, and it will collapse. Oh, no, 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 those buildings are built for that. I said, no, they're not. And uh, while I was sitting there, the first building went down. And, uh, and I said, he said, I can't believe that. I said, you know, if you know anything about structures and know anything about engineering, <clears throat> you don't figure those factors in. Elvin Parrish was always, I thought, very, very intelligent. Um, and R.L. Powell. And, uh, uh, Chief Wouché was a great business guy, but he was not a firefighter. I, I could never imagine him being on the line. He was not the type of person that I would have ever imagined. And let me tell you about Chief Wouché, when he died, I spoke at his funeral. And he had, had left me, this is one of the bolos, he had left me like 10 bolos and uh, some western hats and uh, lots of stuff. And I'd like to tell you another story about Chief Wouché. Uh, he came to me one day and I was working it right after I made captain. I'd been captain probably three or four months and uh, I was on truck two at Central Fire Station. And he came to me one morning and said, I'm planning on going fishing this afternoon. And I had to take my whole uh, boat motor out in two or three years and said, uh, tried to crank it the other day and I couldn't get it to crank. He said, if I bring it up, if I go home to lunch and get it and bring it up here, will you get it running for me? And I said, yeah. So just bring it up here. Well, he got back about quarter to one, I guess. And I put it on what we used to call a hitching rail at Old Central Fire Station. It was a guard that kept it from falling into the coal pit. But anyway, I put it on there, put a garbage can, filled it up with water, and uh, you know, got it running and everything. Well, Chief Barbie came by, walking back down the street from uh, up the street, and uh, he said, and all my guys were standing around me. And I, you know, I was a captain, they were all standing around. And uh, Barbie said, uh, the first thing he did was walk on into the door there, then turned around and came back and said, Captain Osborne said, do you think it's good for you to be out here doing this during class time? And I said, uh, yeah, I said, you guys are learning something about working on motors. He said, well, I don't think they're going to, they're going, that's going to help them fight fires. And I said, well, I, you know, I just don't know what to do. And, and uh, he said, well, I think you need to get in the class. I said, okay. I said, but would you mind going back and telling Chief Fouché he's not going to ever go fishing? <laughs> and, and that was the end of that. <laughs> um, By the way, I kept up the outboard motors and stuff that were that were used in the rescue. I kept them tuned up, and the uh, I've got the original K-12 partner K-12 rescue saw. They did a newspaper article on me showing how to use it. I've got, I own that saw now. I bought it at the city auction. So, uh, and it still runs and I still, I still keep it up. And that's been probably almost 50, over 50 years ago. Yes, uh, mostly it was busy work, like uh, checking insulation in people's attics. I was actually on vacation in Mexico and I had gone on vacation. And uh, when I came back, Chief Ray Richard called me before the shift change, I, before my, I went on duty, the day I came back and said, Captain Osborne, I'm glad you're back. said, I've got some serious allegations against some of your, some of your men. And he said, I'll get, get these guys in the office and I'll be there in 10 minutes. I said, my goodness, what in the world happened while I was gone? 
He said, I've been waiting for you to get back to get this settled. I said, okay. But it was Jim Williams, Robert Atkins, and Charlie Thompson. So I called them in the office. We were sitting there talking to each other, you know, when he came in. Came in and opened his briefcase. And uh, he said, now, I want to tell you guys, I want some straight answers here. He said, uh, this is serious allegations and so forth and so on. He said, uh, do you remember going down to a certain house, one of the streets there behind Station 10, and uh, checking insulation? He said there was a girl there within a, a young lady in a bikini, and y'all went in and talked to her. I said, oh my gosh. I mean, you can imagine what was going through my mind. And uh, he said, they said, yeah, we remember. He said, well, do you remember checking insulation in the attic? And uh, most of them sit there and kind of questioned it. No, I said, she said that they had six inches up there and we didn't go check it. You didn't check it? No. Where well, they actually had 10 inches of insulation in the attic or something, you know, something that wasn't what they said. And uh, they said, you didn't check it. So you're supposed to be checking it. So we, you can't go in somebody's house and tell them, well, you're lying, I need to look at it. I mean, that was what I, that's what I said. And uh, he said, well, uh, we're supposed to be doing a job and I want these guys to do it right. He said, uh, uh, they won't have to be reprimanded for this. I said, you three guys can leave. I can handle this. Because if this is what this is all about, and boy, I jumped in his stuff. And I, told, I said, there will be a, a letter of apology here to these uh, three guys before they leave in the morning. He said, hey, hell will freeze over before you'll see anything from me. And I said, okay. He left. Before he got to the driveway, I was talking to Chief Powell on the phone. Chief Powell said, Captain well, Osborne, I don't know what she did. I said, well, you're in the line of uh, me calling the next one's going to the city manager. Now, if you want to do something about it, fine. If you don't, well, make a long story short. You can ask Jim Williams. I think he's supposed to be here this morning. Mm -hmm. You can ask him. He, he got a letter from the next morning before he left from uh, Ray Richard apologizing for But, uh, you know, that's what an officer's supposed to do. You're supposed to stand up for your men. You know, uh, I would never ask anybody to do anything that I wouldn't do. I would never tell you to go in a building I won't go in. And, uh, and you know, and I think it's the most heartbreaking moment I had, and I don't remember the exact date. Uh, I was riding truck one, I think, at the time. But we went down, and that's when El Richardson Hospital was down in uh, Southeast Greensboro. And as, inside of the hospital, there was a house fire. And, uh, and I went in, went up a shed roof into the bedroom window and found two children, one in the bed and one on the floor. Took them out, both, both of them deceased, and I took, took them out let them down. And uh, before we cleared that call, we got another call on Church Street, no, Summit Avenue, out there right before we get to Station 12 on the right, there was a house trailer park there. There's a house trailer, two more children died in that fire. Well, there was four of them within two hours of each other, four children. And I found all four of them. And that is probably the saddest day to, because I had children about their age. And uh, like I say, there's some things that, that you carry. I never mentioned to my family. I never told my, I still haven't never told my family. Uh, probably my proudest moment, uh, <clears throat> I was in the JCs back years and years ago. And uh, the burn center down at uh, or Chapel Hill, University of Chapel Hill, uh, UNC Hospital, um, was starting a burn center. And the JCs were selling jelly. Well, I contacted the JC headquarters and arranged to sell the first yard jelly in North Carolina. And it was televised and everything. And in the newspaper, a picture of me selling it at Central Fire Station to a burn doctor, to a doctor that it worked with burn victims. And uh, that's probably the, the proudest moment. I mean, there's several things. Uh, I was interviewed by hiring female fire, Chief O'Shea chose me when they were going to hire the first female firefighters to do an interview. And Susan Kidd, who was worked for uh, Channel 2 at the time, was the one interviewing. And I went up at the, at the uh, old tower, the uh, hose drying tower at uh, Central Fire Station, and brought down Rugged Ron. He was named after me, but <laughs> brought him, brought him 190 pounds, took it out of the window by myself and brought down a ladder. And I said, I have no problem with any female being a firefighter if they can do that.
the same thing I just did. And uh, like I say, Chief Fouché is the one that had me do that, uh, he, you know. And uh, for some reason, he always picked me out when there was some interview to be done or, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff up there. Like the, the uh, K-12 rescue saw said, you do a demonstration and we're going to uh, put it in the, uh, in the newspaper and the reporters here doing it. I, I knew I didn't know about it until I went to work that morning, and it happened at what, one o'clock at night before that night. And uh, back then we were working 24 on 24 off, and uh, and then later on that day we got a notice that Lacey Nelson had died, and uh, there was two firefighters, and that was the last day of uh, the decade. It's, it's really sad. It's really sad that. Uh, uh, Trying to figure out how that can be avoided was my first thought was, well, you know, we need to uh, figure out how for this not to happen again. And uh, there are several things you know, that happened in the fire department that uh, afterthought changed. And I can give you another example of that. Um, Jim Parker was, we were out at the mill, the Revelation Mill, and uh, Jim Parker was standing over watching everybody work, cleaning up the place, and the trucks were sitting outside running, and I said, will you go out and turn the trucks off? They're going to run out of fuel. I said, we've been here an hour and a half. He went out there, and he came back in in about 10 minutes. He says, Captain Osborne. Now, he was a private at the time. He, I knew he went on to be, become a battalion chief. He said, I just ran two trucks together out there. I think I total lost both of them. I said, I didn't tell you to move them. I said, just cut them off. So I cut one off and walked down to the other one here. That one came down the road. But anyway, that's how the, that's how the Parker blocks got there. Some of my best friends to this day are the black firefighters. Eddie Coleman, he and I go fishing. Eddie's health is not good now, much like mine. But we have fished. Uh, I've worked on a lot more equipment for him as long as I was in that business. And um, several of them, uh, they're, they're, there's, they're black, there's no difference in the a person. It's what's inside. It's not the color of your skin. It's not, you know, it's, it's what's inside. And there's good and bad in all people. And uh, there's more bad white people in the United States than there are black people because there are more white people. So, uh, for that said, yes, we have a, uh, a lot of uh, bad things going on with blacks, but we have a lot of bad things going on with whites. And, uh, as far as being uh, friends, if you've got a black firefighter, I took Eddie into it. We were down, uh, went fishing at my, one of my son's houses. Both of them have got big lakes, and I went to, to my younger son's house. And we came back, and we were just down in Snow Camp, North Carolina. And I stopped this little restaurant, and I said, let's go in and get something to eat. And Eddie said, you think I can go in there and eat? I said, if you go in there with me, you're going to go in there and eat. And he said, well, you know, I don't look like there's any black people. I said, there will be when you get in there. I said, anybody says anything, you don't say a word. I said, I'll take care of it. And he said, I wish you'd have been with me when I was younger. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, uh, it's what's in the heart. It's not the color of your skin or anything else. Yeah, like I say, I've worked with some that I didn't care for. I've worked with a lot more white people I didn't care for than I have black people because I had a lot more white people. But Plumer Leslie's son was working at the uh, Natural Science Center. And he brought a great big snake up to the Central Fire Station. Eddie was sitting in the TV room asleep in one of those chairs. And he came in with that snake, and Eddie is terrified of snakes. And he got close to Eddie with that thing and woke Eddie up with it, with the head of it, right? And Eddie jumped up and knocked the TV off in the floor. And uh, somebody told Eddie that uh, he's going to have to pay. Now, Eddie wasn't on my company. I was a captain at the time. Eddie wasn't on my company. and. Uh, they said, Eddie's going to pay for the television. I said, no, he won't. I said, if anybody pays for it, it'd be Plumber Leslie and his son. And I said, but the best thing to do is all of us chip in and buy a, a new television. I said, it's not Eddie's fault. But uh, I've always carried a little pair of pliers in my pocket. I got them in my pocket now, a small pair of pliers. And I forgot who it was now kept picking on me. Well, they went to sleep in the TV room and I got a hold of Lopez here in my pliers. I said, you going you gonna to mess with me anymore? He said, what? Who is this? I said, you don't need to know. I said, I just want to know you're going to mess with me anymore. 
he said, no, sir, no, sir, I won't. I said, I'll let go if you, if you promise. <laughs> I don't even know who it was now, but, but I've got a pair of those little pliers in my pocket. I've carried them for years. I've, yeah, I would. All right. I, I would probably do a few things different, but I would do it all over again. If you could speak to the rookies today, what would you give them advice for their career? Uh, probably the most important thing would be to don't let it just be a job. Let it be a passion for helping people. And carry it on through all, throughout your life, not just while you're on duty. But if you see an accident out here, stop and help. If, uh, if you see, uh, I mean, I've, I've stopped on when a volunteer fire department, the one close to my house there, I went, uh, I went, went down one day, they kept hearing these sirens, and I went down to, uh, to see what was going on. Well, they had a house fire, and they were trying to make an interior attack, and the thing had already gotten in the, in the, the, through the ceiling, and it needed to be ventilated. And I said, Is, you gonna ventilate it? And he said, what do you mean? I said, you gonna cut a hole in the roof like, uh, No, we don't ever do that. I said, well, if you got an extra coat and an axe, and I went and did it, and they put the fire out. Well, how do, tell me how that works. And I said, that hot gases and stuff, you gotta have somewhere to go. And I said, it's just building up and getting hotter and hotter inside. And it's just like inside of a stove. I said, if you can't go out the chimney, you know, something's going to, it's going to burn everything up. And uh, they said, well, you know, and this was a fire chief. I said, you know, I never really understood that, why they always cut a hole in the roof. I said, it's the best thing you can do. If it, you know, if it's, if it's broken through the ceiling and it's coming out around the eaves of the house, the best thing you can do is ventilate it immediately. And I don't care what size building it is, it didn't make any difference. That hot air has got to have somewhere to go. And uh, until you understand firefighting totally, I mean, you know, when I came on the fire department, the first thing I wanted to do, if it, if it broke through the, the roof, was put an air ladder nozzle in it. And, and that we burned the building down. I mean, we burned it down. It didn't burn, you know, it probably would have gone out if we had to. If we had to. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, that's, that's firefighting. But if you don't learn from mistakes, uh, then you're not a good firefighter. Learn from your mistakes and don't make that mistake again. You know, whatever it may be. I, I will tell you, my wife and I, you, I may have told you this, uh, were invited to be in the royal tent with the royal family for the Highland Games in 2017. The only American couple that's ever been in there. Wow. And I got, I, got, yeah. I got pictures shaking hands with Prince Charles. And I got the copy of the uh, gold uh, leaf thing that says you're invited to, uh, to join the, in the, in the uh, royal tent during the Highland Games. Back uh, when I retired, I had one grandchild. He was three and a half months old. And uh, for his first Christmas, I retired the 1st of July of 1991. And for his first Christmas, I built him a toy box in the shape of a fire truck. And the size of it is what one sheet of plywood would build. So my daughter put a mattress in the back of it and he slept in it until he was about three years old. And he would get in it every day and play. It had a red light that went around around the top and a, and a, a rope where he could make a bell ring. And the little steering wheel was about probably eight inch diameter and I carved it out of a solid piece of walnut. Well, uh, when he was about two and a half, about three years old, uh, my daughter and her husband uh, separated and divorced and she didn't have a place to keep the fire truck so I took it and put it in the garage with my show cars. And every time he'd come, he would sit in it for hours. Well, when he got to be about six or seven years old, he came to me one day and he said, Papa, I'd like to drive my fire truck. Well, the little fire truck had wooden wheels and it wasn't drivable at all. But I got thinking I'd be better if I just built him another one. But he said, I want to drive that one. So I took it into the garage and my, built a running gear with the steering and everything with brakes, forward and reverse, and electric motor that, that I had taken out of an electric lawnmower. And uh, 
and build it into a, a fire truck that would go about 12 miles per hour forward and reverse, uh, put disc brakes on it, steering, use the same little walnut steering wheel because a bigger steering wheel it was not room for it. And uh, put a pump on it that pumped 60 pounds pressure water. Uh, they used a six gallon uh, diesel fuel tank underneath the seat for water. And uh, uh, the kids, uh, three or four of them would get in the back, two in the cab, and they would have build a little car, put a metal hood on it, one of these little plastic cars that children ride around in, battery powered cars, but it was actually a Jeep, and made, put a metal hood on it and put a stainless steel uh, container in there that I could put oil and rags in and set them on fire, and then they would come and put the fire out. And they were in parades, they were in one in Summerfield, they were one in Stokesdale, uh, Pleasant Garden, couple down in Alamance County, but and at their school when they were in kindergarten and first grade, second grade, I would take the fire truck there and they would uh, show it, uh, do a demonstration with it. But uh, I still have the fire truck now. It doesn't belong to me, it belongs to my grandson who's 29 years old now. But uh, if he ever has children, he's not married, if he ever gets married and has children, it'll be theirs. I mean, it's his fire truck because I built it for him. But every one of my kids, we have eight grandkids now, and every one of them have driven the fire truck, every one of them have been in parades and stuff with it. It's been on television two or three times. I've got several films of it, and uh, it's one of a kind. Uh, somebody from Roanoke, Virginia saw it at one of the car shows that I do, and, uh, and wanted to buy it, and I told them it wasn't for sale. I said, it's the only one in the world, and, uh, and I'm not building another one. <laughs> But anyway, uh, uh, it's, it's been quite, a, uh, quite an experience for the, for the children. But uh, Roy's folks, is one of, and I've got a copy of that that uh, I, I should send it to, you make an extra copy and send it to the fire department so everybody can see it, of the uh, video of it. We hope you enjoyed watching these documentaries. It was our goal to share and preserve the memories of our retired Greensboro firefighters. It is our desire that these documentaries will inspire future generations to continue the brotherhood, sisterhood, and camaraderie while always striving for excellence in their careers. While fire apparatus, equipment, and technology have improved, several things will always remain the same the courage and bravery it takes to mitigate natural and man-made disasters will always be a part of the job. Although our retirees are no longer a physical part of the GFD world, a giant piece of each retiree's memories have been shared with you today. These memories will be in their hearts and minds forever. A special thank you goes out to Captain Harold Haney for his many long hours of recording and editing. Thank you, Harold. A job well done. Mm -hmm.